so, um, my name is Leanne. I'm the theme manager for themes three, four, and five. And it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, uh, Dr. Ruth Sapir Pishadzi. Um, Ruth is an assistant professor at the Department of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology in the, at McGill University. And um, her research focuses on studying the determinants of kidney transplant outcomes with, uh, and she's particularly interested in identifying strategies to prevent immune mediated injury following kidney transplant. So the topic of her webinar today is research on precision medicine technologies and rejection prevention. And with that, I'm gonna give the floor to Ruth and let her tell us all about her work. So take it away, Ruth. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you so much both to you and uh, to the CDTRP for the kind invitation to present at the training seminar today. The topic that I was requested to discuss uh, is uh, research on precision medicine technologies and how this can be conducive to prevention of rejection. And this aligns very nicely with my uh, program's overarching goal. As a transplant nephrologist and clinical epidemiologist, I'm very much interested in uh, uh, putting forward steps to try and have patients uh, who receive a kidney transplant enjoy this transplant for as long as possible. At the same time that they enjoy an excellent quality of life and that the transplant process will be safe with minimal adverse effects. So this brings us to the uh, uh, content of this presentation. And in the remainder of this talk, what I'll try and do is to demonstrate to you how we can harness precision medicine tools to achieve this overarching goals. I will share with you a few examples where precision medicine technologies are relevant to transplantation. What are the advantages and challenges associated with discovery and implementation of such tools, and I will outline some strategies to overcome these challenges, as well as describe the infrastructure that's required to develop a precision medicine program. So let us start with the definition. What is precision medicine? The National Institutes of Health suggest that precision medicine is an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual patients genes, environment, and lifestyle. With this approach, they believe that doctors and researchers can help predict more accurately which treatment or prevention strategy would work in a particular patient given a health concern. So we are lucky to say that in the context of kidney transplantation, overall, we enjoy uh, excellent success, and this is most prominent early post-transplant. In this uh, figure that is taken from a seminal article by Wolf et al., the authors looked at the adjusted relative risk of death, and this was studied in uh, a group of first deceased donor transplant recipients, and in contrast to patients who underwent dialysis and remained on the waiting list. The patients from both groups were followed uh, for a similar period of time, and the estimates of the relative risk of um, uh, mortality initially and uh, over time advantages in survival uh, were studied uh, given a similar period of time on the waiting list prior to um, evaluating these patients over follow-up. And these estimates were adjusted for relevant patient demographic and disease-related characteristics. So as you can see in this figure, the survival ad advantage in the context of kidney transplantation is very obvious beyond the second half of the first uh, transplant year. However, when patients in fact experience graft loss, this is associated with increased risk. And this includes a threefold increase in mortality, a decrease in quality of life, and a fourfold increase in health care costs. So, what contributes to the risk of graft failure? And of those, what is important uh, to patients? So, is this outcome relevant? 
So this very same question was studied by the leaders of the standardized outcomes in nephrology song group and specifically that interested in outcomes in transplantation. This group sought to establish outcomes from clinical trials that were pertinent to various stakeholders, including patients, decision makers, caretakers, amongst others. The process of developing the core outcomes or identifying them followed a process of verification of outcomes reported in clinical trials through a process of systematic review and thereafter a survey with stakeholders to prioritize these priorities. And this was finalized by a process of a consensus uh, workshop. So as you can see over here, of the core outcomes, graft health is of key importance, and so are outcomes like survival or mortality, as well as very common complications of uh, immune suppression medications like cardiovascular disease, cancer, and infection. And participation in life activities uh, that could also relate to quality of life was also deemed very important. So the first of these was graft failure. So what compromises the success of a kidney transplant and shortens the survival of an allograft? While many factors can contribute uh, to this and jeopardize the uh, survival of a transplanted organ, the overall overwhelming cause of graft loss remains rejection. And this is illustrated very nicely in this uh, figure here, where the authors studied the attributed cause of graft failure in biopsy for cause population. And as you can see over here, the large majority of patients experienced graft loss secondary to antibody-mediated rejection, probable antibody-mediated rejection, or mixed rejection. With regards to antibody-mediated rejection, as outlined in this uh, pictogram from the Paris group, this is a process that evolves over time. Starting with immune injury secondary to the development of donor-specific antibodies, through activation and complement, and development of microcirculatory inflammation. All of these initially are deemed subclinical. However, over time, these injuries can evolve into uh, clinically apparent acute rejection events, and eventually chronic lesions may develop that could over time compromise graft function, resulting dysfunction, and eventually graft loss. How is the diagnosis of antibody-mediated rejection made, you may ask? This is a complex diagnosis, and much of the effort to standardize the diagnostic scheme is pursued by the members of the BAM Foundation for Allograft Pathology. This is one of the key classification, and as outlined in the prior slide, it relies on verification of presence of donor-specific antibodies, as well as evidence on tissue biopsies or biopsies of the kidney transplant, um, as well as uh, staining of those, or uh, including immunofluorescence, on uh, spectrums of um, light microscopy as well as electron microscopy. So lesions identified on the biopsies, as well as information on donor-specific antibodies, is used to construct a diagnosis of antibody-mediated rejection. What are the challenges currently to identifying antibody-mediated rejection? So when applying the BAM uh, scheme for antibody-mediated uh, rejection, this is largely done uh, by uh, uh, a combined and collaborative effort on the part of pathologists as well as clinicians. And this slide summarizes the findings of a survey that was conducted by the uh, Banff Antibody Mediated Ridge Injury Working Group. This group electronically surveyed clinicians and pathologists worldwide regarding the diagnosis and treatment of six cases of um, rejection scenarios. The aim of the study was to determine how the Banff Antibody Mediated Rejection Classification 
for kidney transplant is interpreted in practice and how does this affect therapy? So 95 participants uh, included clinicians and 72 renal pathologists participated in this survey and uh, responded on, the, uh, on their notion of the relevant diagnosis given a clinical scenario. So both clinical information as well as biopsy findings and donor-specific antibody information was provided. And if you can see over here for pathologists and here for clinicians, the assigned diagnosis in comparison to the reference standard, which was what the BAMF group that designed the survey predicted these diagnoses should have been, deferred by 26.1% for pathologists and 34.5% for clinicians. The greatest discordance between the reference standard and clinician diagnosis was when the histologic features of ABMR were, were present, but no donor-specific antibodies were identified. For pathologists, the greatest discordance was in the context of um, acute or active antibody-mediated rejection where a transplant had history of a positive cross-match. These diagnoses that were assigned had also uh, demonstrated implications with regards to the choice of therapy. So you see in this table on the left-hand side, potential therapies that could apply in the context of antibody-mediated uh, rejection. It's a detailed list, uh, although not uh, uh, complete, additional therapies are possible. But at the time, those were the ones that were considered uh, by the group. So you can see the treatment approaches were heterogeneous, but were largely linked to the assigned diagnosis. When acute or active antibody-mediated rejection was diagnosed by the clinician, the treatment was recommended in 95.3% of the time, whereas only 77.7% .7 of the time, treatment was recommended in the context of chronic lesions. This survey allows us to conclude that the BAMF antibody-mediated rejection classification is vulnerable to misinterpretation. And this may have implications in the context of patient management. An editorial that followed this uh, survey highlighted how we are still in an effort to pursue both an accurate and precise diagnosis for antibody-mediated rejection. And the recommendations that followed from the editorial were to uh, delineate or apply molecular diagnostic methods that are in evolution um, for the diagnosis of rejection, identified opportunities to educate both pathologists and clinicians where uh, reading and summarizes of, of specific diagnostic uh, characteristics may be of benefit in the context of pathologists reviewing uh, the slides and for clinicians, it's important to discuss both common and uncommon clinical presentations of antibody-mediated rejection that they may encounter or, or less frequently so in the context of their clinical practice. But one of the important recommendations was also in the context of tools that are readily available, that there was an opportunity to promote uniform and consistent reporting of pathological findings. And in response to this recommendation, in collaboration with the Rules and Dissemination BAMF group, led by Candice Rufus, Jan Becker, and in collaboration with a pathologist at the NUHC, uh, Dr. Fizé, as well as uh, eminent pathologists uh, uh, from Canada, Dr. Sisson uh, Mengel, as well as a group of uh, uh, additional uh, international colleagues, we have developed and applied a computer program assigning kidney allograft rejection diagnosis using information in, such as donor-specific antibodies and biopsy-based um, light microscopy and electron microscopy findings to assign a diagnosis of rejection in a standardized fashion. We believe that this kind of automation process can serve as a diagnostic aid in the service of pathologists and transplant clinicians. And this may provide an opportunity for integration in electronic medical records, 
as well as standardized application could be conducive to future knowledge synthesis when applied in the context of clinical trials and observational studies. To emphasize the point that we believe that the effort still requires a strong collaboration with uh, pathologists, clinicians, and histocompatibility experts to assign the diagnosis. So what are other precision medicine technologies uh, that could serve in the context of preventing rejection? One of these has to do with the culprit of donor and recipient incompatibility that's most commonly considered as a cause for rejection. And this pictogram over here shows you the uh, HLA um, or human leukocyte antigens. And HLA is the uh, major trigger in the context of graft rejections. There are 11 classical human leukocyte antigens or HLA genes. Class one include A, B, and C, and class two include DRB1, 3, 4, 5, DQA1 and B1, and DPA1 and B1. Located on chromosome six, these genes are considered one of the most polymorphic in the human genome, and there are now more than 22,000 different alleles that have been reported uh, for human leukocyte antigens. So how are human leukocyte antigens classified? And this is important because it uh, delineates the different kind of human leukocyte antigens that, are, uh, that need to be considered. So this first field over here for an HLA-A molecule represents an allele group. If only this information is made available, this represents a whole group of different proteins that could be uh, informed by this HLA type. The second field over here of the uh, HLA nomenclature actually is able to capture a specific HLA protein. Additional codes are available to describe some additional genetic information where synonymous uh, DNA is coded by substitution um, and does not result in a different protein over here. And over here, if there's differences in code that do not, uh, uh, that are uh, differences in the sequence that are not in the coding region. This high polymorphism in HLA results in a risk for immune sensitization. And immune sensitization is important in the context of uh, transplantation for the following reason. When a patient is exposed to human leukocyte antigens that are different from their own, they can become sensitized or develop antibodies to those. This could happen uh, in the context of transfusions, pregnancies, or subsequent to transplantation. And other less common scenarios uh, that could result in sensitization include infections and molecular mimicry. Now, patients who have a large selection of antibodies against HLA, and the way this is captured over here, if this figure represents a donor pool, including 100% of our donors, when a patient's serum might interact with a panel representative of the donor pool, there's going to be an output. Uh, uh, the output is called calculated uh, panel of incompatible antigens, such that this is a, a value that is a percentage ranging from zero to 100%, where 0% says that the patient has no preformed antibodies uh, against this donor pool that could be detected at the time this uh, study was uh, pursued. This does not uh, uh, deny the fact that patients could, could develop antibodies in the future. So in the context of transplantation nowadays, transplantation will not be pursued where a transplant candidate might have antibodies against the donor. So in red represented no match. So you would not pursue a transplant in that context. However, in the absence of antibodies against a particular donor's HLA type, anti, uh, transplantation may be pursued and will be deemed a possible match. As you can see over here, 
we haven't, uh, in this kind of context, sec secured ourselves that antibodies might not uh, develop over time. And this is why the green light or a complete green light is missing here. So we proceed with caution and with chronic immunosuppression on board. What are the implications of PRA? We studied this in uh, the context of the scientific registry of transplant recipients. So uh, uh, the panel of reactive uh, antigens was quantified and categorized in a range of zero uh, up to 20, up to 80, and up to 100%. And what we can see over here, that the risk of transplantation decreased the higher the panel reactive antibody percentage. And the risk of mortality on the waiting list increased the higher the PRA value. So this has implications both uh, for access as well as uh, risk of survival on the waiting list. There are ways for us to improve precision with regards to delineating the risk when moving forward to transplantation. And this has been recently studied in the context, uh, when considering the context of uh, epitopes. HLA antigens are, um, are antigens uh, that are presented on the graft and they are responsible for rejection as mentioned earlier. Precise HLA matching between identical twins or siblings is associated with an excellent transplant outcome with little rejection. However, cl close matching of donors and recipients in the context of uh, transplantation is challenging, but efforts to optimize those has been shown to improve outcomes. HLA epitopes are structures on these HLA antigens that actually inform the immune response or the interaction with uh, antibodies against HLA antigens. These represent short structural segments uh, on the antigens that are accessible to interaction with uh, antibodies. It's important to note that some epitopes might be shared across HLA antigens that are coded for by different alleles, making certain antigen mismatches permissible. And there are opportunities to pursue virtual donor and recipient matching at the level of the epitope as we move forward. And this is a, a possible strategy to improve graft outcomes. This slide over here shows uh, Rene Duquesnoy. Professor Duquesnoy, a professor emeritus, conceived a program called HLA Matchmaker. And this program uh, uh, is a reference to one of the most commonly used models, theoretical models, for B-cell epitopes in recent years. The B-cell epitopes in the HLA Matchmaker program are often referred to as epilets. This online registry, the HLA Epitope Registry, was developed by Dr. Duquesnoy and Marilyn Marari in collaboration with a group from Brazil, led by Dr. Semiramis de Monte. And this uh, website summarizes a selection of uh, epitopes, the alleles associated with them, as well as a selected group that has been validated. And the validation or verification was done through a, a, an experimental process where a particular Eplet incompatibility between a donor and recipient was deemed a culprit for the development of donor-specific antibodies. In recent years, a growing body of literature suggests that there is a role for cumulative eplet mismatches to determine immune-mediated injuries, starting from donor-specific antibodies through immune-mediated injuries apparent uh, on allograft biopsies, as well as uh, uh, those associated with graft failure. This, these observations make it attractive to consider matching at the level of the epitope in the context of uh, organ allocation. However, this effort is challenged at a variety of levels. To be able to consider compatibility uh, at the level of the epitope, 
it is critical to ensure that accurate HLA genotyping is available. This slide was taken from a publication by uh, Dr. Anat Tambour, where she considers molecular methods to detect homology and polymorphism in HLA systems. So let us uh, consider what these concepts uh, mean. Over here, you can see a representation of the first 100 amino acids for an HLA-A allele. And we have a reference allele or with its uh, consensus sequence, as well as a list of additional uh, alleles. And what you can see over here that uh, there is significant homology represented by the dashes here across HLA alleles. But at the same time, there are areas that are polymorphic, that vary from one uh, sequence to another. And these are designated by single uh, letters over here in these sequence and are marked by different colors. You can see over here that while some alleles may code for a similar um, uh, polymorphisms, they might be distinguished from other alleles in others. So the information with regards to uh, HLA typing is critical to delineate the sequence of polymorphisms, eplets in the context of HLA matchmaker or uh, epitopes as a biological representation of the areas on HLA antigens that, in, that interact with the immune system. Precise genotype is, is critical for us to pursue forward. And in this analysis that we present over here, that was published by our group in 2018, we evaluated the implications of imputation or prediction of allele level HLA type that is required to delineate uh, compatibility at the level of the epitopes on the assigned um, uh, epitopes. Now, here we consider applets, which, is, which are the B cell epitopes that I mentioned, but at the same time relevant to the immune response are also T cell epitopes. And these T cell epitopes that are uh, mentioned here are amongst the predicted indirectly recognizable HLA uh, epitopes. So in this analysis uh, over here, we demonstrate the following. If you were to look at the ABC or class one HLA uh, types, if those were to be imputed for uh, donors, one would, uh, versus measurement, measured HLA types, one would uh, identify that in the majority of cases, antibody verified eplets would be uh, consistent with uh, when imputed versus measured. However, lower degree of accuracy and a difference that is greater than zero is identified in the context of overall applet mismatches as well as when considering T cell epitopes. This is more pronounced in the context of class two or DRB1 and DQB1 uh, alleles and their associated uh, B and T cell epitopes. In this analysis over here, what we demonstrate is uh, rather than the cumulative number of applet or uh, perch mismatches, we look at the actual identity of the repertoire of applets and T cell epitopes that were uh, identified in the imputation process versus those that were actually measured. And we can see over here Again, that largely in the class one, more so for HLA-A, there was good agreement with regards to the overall repertoire of epitopes. However, this was compromised as we go to HLA-B, as well as the class two uh, uh, HLA uh, epitopes. So what are the implications of this? This suggests that we need to optimize methods to allow us to accurately type 
uh, precisely and accurately type the HLA genes in the pre-transplant context. But this context is usually sensitive to time limitations. So the methods that are uh, in evolution will need to overcome this uh, time restriction and allow both correct uh, information on HLA typing as well as to deliver this information within a short period of time. Currently, innovative typing methods like next generation sequencing are in evolution and they can allow definitions of these epitopes precisely and enable transplant teams to proactively uh, ensure compatibility of donors and recipients. But where polymorphism of HLA or the, significance uh, the, the significant repertoire of polymorphisms in the context of HLA cannot allow perfect matching between donors and recipients, there are additional strategies that uh, can be applied in the context of precision medicine to mitigate rejection risk. And to be uh, complete, I'll mention some of those. So epitope matching can be considered at the time of organ allocation, and also can be considered as a predictor uh, of risk subsequent to transplant if optimal matching cannot be accomplished. To mitigate risk in the context of residual mismatch, what we need to do is consider um, strategies to monitor patients, and this can be personalized depending on the baseline in, uh, immune risk identified for that patient. And in addition to that, we can also personalize therapy. And there are opportunities to consider uh, metabolisms that is coded by genes of particular immunosuppression regimens, efforts to measure the effect of medication or particular immune suppression medications at the level of the tissue, efforts to measure drug levels to inform adverse effects of certain immune suppression medications and try to decrease those. And of course, considering the aspect of adherence of patients to the regimen, where if there is no adherence, none of these aspects could be considered because the patient is basically not exposed to immune suppression. Now, adjustments can be made in the context where the risk of rejection is high, where a high epitope mismatch is present, a high immune competence or donor-specific response is observed, or that the, pharmaco, um, the system's pharmacology profile is not uh, um, it increases the risk of experiencing rejection. On the other hand, when a low risk profile is identified across those steps, we can consider decreasing immune suppression that is prescribed such that we can avoid increasing risk of complications of immune suppression such as infections. Employing these kinds of strategies allow us to avoid a one type fits all type of uh, approach and pursue what is envisioned by the precision medicine concept to ensure that the patients are the patients are exposed to treatment that is minimal in toxicity but at the same time maximal in efficacy and success so in the context where treatment it indeed meets these criteria there's an opportunity to continue with the same treatment so, such that we've identified the optimal drug and a dose. In the context where toxicity might be excessive, even though the treatment is deemed um, a success, we can modify the uh, therapy or modify the dose. A similar strategy can be used in the context where um, uh, minimal side effects are observed and the treatment is deemed not uh, effective. So you could use alternative drug or dose. And in the context where the toxicity is excessive and there's no evidence of uh, a successful therapy, but rather there's failure, you want to treat with a completely different drug. So I've outlined to you potential scenarios where precision medicine tools can be used in the context of transplantation. 
starting from donor and recipient compatibility through immune response and uh, personalized uh, therapies through systems pharmacology approaches. I want to uh, next summarize opportunities with regards to implementation of precision uh, medicine programs and what are the potential advantages, the challenges facing us, as well as the infrastructure required to successfully implement precision medicine programs. So for this purpose, I will uh, rely on a construct or a framework called P6 medicine that considers preventative, predictive, personalized, participatory, psychocognitive, and public uh, aspects. So in the context of preventative medicine, we have opportunities to better understand the underlying mechanisms for rejection. We can improve our approaches to preventing rejection by ensuring donor and recipient epitope compatibility as demonstrated to you. Predictive strategies in the context of preventing rejection uh, could consider um, scenarios where residual mismatch is present or uh, patients with a particular profile that are likely to experience certain complications related to immune suppression. A personalized approach in the context of uh, uh, transplantation would allow us to, from one side, improve rejection diagnosis, and at the same time, allow us to tailor immune monitoring schedule and immune suppression regimens to the patient's specific molecular picture. So in the context of higher epitope uh, incompatibility, we can try and monitor patients more closely or uh, ensure that we avoid reduction in immune suppression over time, because they would be deemed at higher risk for rejection. To ensure success in the context of kidney transplantation, we need patient participation. And here, we rely on a large-scale participation of patients. We need big data in order to be able to discern what incompatibilities at the individual uh, epitope level are important to avoid, which of those are associated with greater risk on one side. No less important is the aspect, not just of participation in research, is the emphasis on the role of patient engagement and partnership. In this kind of context, when pursuing precision medicine programs and pursuing research uh, to promote development of precision medicine technologies, participation, of, uh, participation and partnership with patients can help us delineate which outcomes are of most importance. This way, we ensure that our research is patient-centered. Moreover, active engagement of patients can facilitate uh, knowledge translation and actually uh, ensuring where findings of research uh, are actually uh, serving patients and benefit uh, them, amongst others. Another aspect of uh, P6 medicine is the emphasis on the psychocognitive part. So very complementary to participatory uh, medicine, this uh, uh, portion focuses on uh, strategies to promote immune suppression adherence, understanding what are the barriers that prohibit patients from gaining access to uh, treatment and the creation of therapeutic alliances such that a recommendation that is given by clinicians is grounded in patient uh, and, and is done in consultation with patients and is cognizant of their preferences and uh, choices. Last but not least is the, the aspect of 
uh, consideration of uh, the public when pursuing precision medicine tools. So here we can outline a variety of uh, aspects that are relevant. So first, uh, we need to standardize the collection of data uh, in the context of passive collection in electronic health records. We need to develop tools that would allow us to uh, build, analyze, and share large data sets, uh, including medical data. Now, aware, being aware, being respectful, and uh, cognizant of the fact that this contribution of data warrants also significant efforts to protect the participants' privacy and confidentiality. But this is a strategy to engage practically all the community uh, with regards to uh, informing precision medicine technologies. As you're pursuing a precision medicine program, it is also important to verify that the key stakeholders are aware, are supportive, and are, would be interested in implementing the methods uh, and technologies that have been identified. So uh, patients, caretakers, providers, uh, members of the public, decision makers, payers, all need to take part in this uh, discussion and share their perspectives. It is also important to address legal and ethical tensions uh, associated with applying precision medicine tools. For example, if such tools were to apply in the context of allocation, there could be um, a tension between healthcare providers' uh, need to consider the importance of utility of the allograft. But at the same time, one needs to ensure that within any such program, uh, we consider equity very carefully and processes are integrated to ensure that these methods do not result in um, uh, inadvertent compromise of access in uh, particular members of the population. Finally, to justify public funding of precision medicine tools, it is important that incorporated within uh, the collection of data pertaining to their role in diagnosis and treatment is also information on the uh, costs associated with their implementation. And uh, we maximize the benefit drawn from those and minimize the cost at the same time. So to pursue uh, such a program, as you can imagine, this requires an effort from multiple parties. And here I want to uh, mention an effort that was put forward uh, in the form of the Genome Canada Transplant Consortium that is co-led uh, with uh, Drs. Keon Caulfield Bryan and this uh, uh, generous group of uh, co-applicants uh, who share expertise in uh, transplantation, histocompatibility, pathology, amongst others, organizations such as CBS, Hema Quebec, scientific societies, transplant programs, uh, national uh, programs in HLA and genomics, and uh, laboratories uh, working across centers uh, in Canada, as well as across the world. So there's representation uh, from uh, the US and uh, Europe, and we invite collaboration at uh, even a larger scale moving forward. So this kind of effort and partnership with academia, healthcare, patients, government, and industry is required uh, for us to uh, successfully harness precision medicine technologies in the service of uh, transplant patients, and amongst others, prevent the risk of rejection. So we are all working together to prevent rejection, optimize expensive therapy, and prolong graft survival. Together, we'll work to restore a healthy and productive life for patients and their families and reduce the need for retransplantation, this way making more organs available for patients. We want to extend those benefits to other countries and through uh, collaborations uh, and partnerships globally. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions.